Thank you so much for joining us today. This is part two of our Custody Guardian Ad Litem Pro Bono training. I'm gonna talk through just a few things with you as we get started. My name is Jen Massey. I'm the Pro Bono Director at Children's Law Center. I will briefly just talk to you a little bit about our Pro Bono program. If you've joined us for other sessions, then this will be information that you've heard. So a little bit of a review and reminder. I'll talk about our virtual training series briefly, where we are in that process, a few notes about today's session in particular, and then another reminder for where our on-demand resources are to support you doing this work. So Children's Law Center is fighting so each child in DC can grow up with a loving family, good health, and a quality education. We're partnering with hundreds of pro bono lawyers each year so that we can serve over 5,000 children and families. We place pro bono cases in three different areas, our family, health, and education practice areas. We are here today to talk about one of those family law practice areas for custody guardian ad litem. Again, these are cases as we're discussing part two of this training series, we're thinking about best interest representation for children who are caught in high conflict custody cases. So that's why we're here and that's what we're gonna continue the training series about today. Supporting our pro bono attorneys, that's important to us at CLC. So we're gonna make sure that we're screening our cases before placing them with pro bono volunteers who may not be handling these cases otherwise or have experience doing so. We have lots of training materials and resources to support you doing the work. And then we assign mentors so that you have someone who does have experience and expertise in the practice area and can guide you with various recommendations and strategy discussions throughout the duration of your case. In terms of where we are in this training series, so this is part two for custody guarding that litem, we do have a part three. So we are going to continue the discussion uh, with two different subject areas that will be covered by our director of social work at Children's Law Center. So we'll be talking about what is it like to communicate with children and teens in these cases when you're serving as the guardian ad litem best interest attorney. We're also gonna talk a little bit about uh, domestic violence, substance abuse, and abuse and neglect. There are various allegations that occur in these cases. And so we're gonna chat through uh, what that might mean in handling one of these cases. I've also highlighted on this screen, cultural humility. There is a separate training that we're doing that covers all of the practice areas that we place pro bono. And we're gonna talk about our client reality is working with our clients, respecting their expertise in their lives, and doing our best to provide culturally humble representation. Today's training, again, part two, we are here for custody law and procedure. So you're going to hear what are the different ways that custody might be determined in these cases? What's the legal standard? What's the process for sort of sorting these things out? And you're gonna hear a lot of different options about how these cases can resolve and what it may look like as a legal arrangement. And we'll talk a little bit about the procedure in these cases as well. What is the life cycle of one of these cases look like, for example? We also sent uh, slides that complement this section on child support and civil protection orders. Those are related materials that we won't discuss during this session, but of course, check out. If you have questions, you can shoot them over. Um, you'll see that that's on this slide as well. You can use the chat if you're joining us live. If you are watching this on demand, please feel free to send me an email. Happy to go over any questions you might have re reviewing our training materials. You also see a note here, a reminder if you've watched other trainings or, or joined other trainings recently, we are handling cases remotely. We are continuing to navigate what the court is doing with its operations remotely, and we can guide you through the mentoring process about the logistics and ins and outs of that. On-demand resources from training slides, presentations, videos, and training manuals, you can find them on our website. If you go to childrenslawcenter.org at the bottom, you'll see where it's been highlighted here with a couple of arrows where you can click on pro bono and find this page that has different links on the right-hand side to find those materials I just referenced. If you are interested in a case, please do reach out. We can talk through what available cases we have, see what might be a good fit. It's definitely um, a great great area of the law to chat about the cases in particular to see how, um, what might be of interest to you and what might be a good fit for you. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you're interested. We do have cases available. 
And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that our presenter today, Diane Weinroth, Special Counsel at Children's Law Center, can go ahead and pull her screen up. She is going to go through our custody law and procedure section today. And if you have questions, you can pop them in the chat. We'll address them now or at the end or after as needed. And you may have seen a training evaluation in the survey, excuse me, training evaluation survey in the chat as well. Um, so I'll direct you to that at the end so you can let us know how today goes. Thank you so much. And Diane, um, you can take it from here. Diane, I think your mute might still be on, or at least it looks like it might still be muted. We do have the slides up. And Diane, I can't, let's see. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, that is oh, perfect. Thanks, Diane. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm getting better at Zoom as we all are, but um, I haven't dealt with quite this configuration. So um, apologies, I think we're set up now. Um, uh, I know uh, you've heard this before, but I really do wanna thank you all for taking this training. Um, it's uh, incre an incredibly valuable um, service to kids, to the families, to the court. The judges are incredibly appreciative. And even if you've never set foot in superior court, even if you do, you know, mergers and acquisition or, you know, communications law, you can do this. You really can. We all had our first case and, and CLC is very, very much here to, to support you. So thank you very much. Um, my section is, as Jen said, gonna walk you through um, the substantive and procedural law of custody cases. Uh, because that's the context within which you'll be operating. Um, we won't really talk about child support and civil protection orders. We may reference that a little bit and you'll see why. Uh, there are slides about uh, those, those, those issues. Um, uh, and again, you'll sort of see why we, we give you materials about them, but you're not really gonna need to learn about uh, those issues and those kinds of cases during the training. Um, and as Jen said, um, if you have questions, um, I, can, I can hang around on Zoom after the presentation. You can also um, type them in the chat box. Alyssa from CLC is gonna be monitoring that. I can't promise that we'll do it during the presentation. Uh, we will if we can, but if not, they'll be memorialized there and we can, we can always talk um, afterwards. I, I wish we could make it more interactive, but you know, we're all still kind of learning the best way to do that on Zoom. And we wanna you know, get you the information you need. But uh, we really, really do welcome questions. Okay, so let's get started. Let's get started, assuming I can get this to move forward. Okay, this worked fine before. There we go, okay, let me just, oh, it's slow, yeah. Um, be aware um, that anything that, you know, is a little different because of COVID is in red, but for purposes of my section, there won't be all that much that's different because of COVID. Um, uh, um, and again, in other sections, people will talk about sort of how the court is dealing with life remotely, which is basically how DC Superior Court is operating. Um, and we can support you in that um, throughout the duration of the case. Um, so the issue is custody, and uh, there are three types of cases in which the court has the authority to enter orders that make custody determinations, and you could end up functioning within any of those contexts, even though the issue is custody. Uh, the court can issue orders about custody in connection with divorce cases, or um, it could be what I think of as a freestanding custody case. Uh, nobody's getting divorced. The parents, may, uh, parents or parties might not even be married. Um, but, and, and essentially the only thing that's being asked for is custody or possibly custody and child support. And then there are civil protection order cases, domestic violence restraining orders. Uh, custody uh, orders can be issued in those cases. 
Um, we're not getting many referrals uh, for GALs in CPO cases, which is why we're not taking the time to really give you training in how those cases operate. But we have materials about them, and you know, should that uh, should should we get a referral like that, and you're interested, we can talk to you more uh, about CPOs. So where can you find the law about custody, the substantive law and the procedural law? Um, here are the, the main places that you will find statutory law. Uh, there's not a lot of statutory law, but there is some, and it's incredibly important. With regard to custody cases that are between parents, um, the, the, the central substantive statutory law is in Title 16, Chapter 9 of the DC Code, especially 16-914. If, however, the case is between a parent and a non-parent, which we often call third-party custody cases or third-party visitation cases, there is a, a whole sort of uh, subchapter that addresses um, uh, those kinds of cases that's at 16-831.01 at SEC that we call the third-party custody statute. And then there's the civil protection order statute. But the substantive law of custody, the, the CPO statute deals basically with the law of domestic violence restraining orders, CPO, civil protection orders, um, and not really with the substantive law of custody. The substantive law of custody is addressed in these other two places and is, in essence, uh, uh, transferred to CPO cases when, when, when someone's asking for custody in connection with a civil protection order. Um, there are court rules in D.C. Superior Court. Um, the court rules that govern divorce and custody cases are not the rules of civil procedure, the D.C. Superior Court rules of civil procedure. They are the domestic relations proceedings rules. So if it's a divorce case or a custody case, those are the court rules that are going to govern. And I do like to mention that new rules were adopted in November 2018. That does feel like a long time ago, but frankly, everyone's still getting used to it. Um, some rules didn't change at all. Some rules changed dramatically. Um, and so just should you, in the unlikely event that you actually have to do case law research about the rules, which is unlikely, uh, just be aware that you know, you've got to kind of make sure, you've got to see what the new rule says and whether old case law applies. Um, there's also a set of rules called the general family rules that apply to any case filed in family court. Um, and those tend not to be terribly relevant to, to divorce and custody cases, but I feel duty bound to mention that they exist. Um, there's a separate set of rules for civil protection order cases, but again, we're not gonna dwell on that because um, you are not likely to get directly involved in a, in a CPO case. Uh, there is case law. Um, I don't know where that slide went because there used to be a slide, but I think, I think, but there's not all that much case law in custody, uh, in the arena of custody. There, there is case law every once in a while. It's crucial, but there is not all that much case law. I think for a lot of reasons. Two of the most important ones are that so many litigants are pro se that appeal is not really an issue. Um, the other is that many litigants, even if there were something appealable, just will live with the outcome and not appeal. And also, there may not be appealable issues. Uh, so there is case law, but not mass quantities of case law in the area of custody. Um, so that's where you'll find the kind of core law about that relates to, to um, this. Uh, so this is your welcome slide, which has less relevance these days because you're not going to be setting foot probably in the courthouse. Our court really, I think, is focused on operating remotely, uh, filing remotely, getting information remotely, having hearings remotely. Uh, that could change, but right now that seems to be what's in the cards. But still, here you are. This is a little schematic thing that I came up with um, to give you a sense of how our court is set up, which can be useful uh, going forward sometimes. 
Um, our court uh, is a, we have a, a trial court, which is DC Superior Court, and we have one level of appellate court, the DC Court of Appeals. Our court is divided up into different divisions, um, and you see them here, family court, criminal division, civil division, tax and probate, and domestic violence. And the little bubbles show you what kinds of cases are assigned to each division. And the clerk's offices are more or less divided up this way as well. Um, and the judges are assigned to various divisions and various branches and various calendars. Um, so they're assigned to a division and then maybe to a branch and to a specific ca calendar in that, that branch or in that division. And our judges rotate, which is not true of every state court system, uh, but they do rotate. The rotations tend to be fairly long, uh, anywhere from one to three years for starters. So often a judge will be able to see a case through from beginning to end, but every once in a while you're caught in a rotation and the judge changes. Um, so that does happen. Um, divorce and custody cases are assigned to the domestic relations branch of family court, which is, and family court is a part of DC Superior Court. Uh, civil protection order cases are assigned to the domestic violence division of the court. And again, it's nothing we have to dwell on right now, but you know, as time goes on, again, everything's gonna be online, but as you're sort of researching things about your case, you know, we'll help you get oriented to where to look for information um, based on how you know, the clerk's offices are set up and how things are assigned. Let's talk about what custody is, because that's central to what you're doing. What is, what is being litigated and what are the options here? What do we mean when we talk about custody? There is a definition of custody in the statute. For many, many years, there wasn't any definition in the statute, but now there is. Um, and it breaks custody into two big components. One is legal custody, and if you want a one word or two word way of thinking about what legal custody is, it's the right to make big decisions about the child. The statutory definition is on the screen. Uh, you can read it. In some ways, it's really helpful. In other ways, it's very general and vague because inevitably definitions don't, can't, can only micromanage up to a point. So legal custody is making the big decisions about the child. The big component of custody is physical custody. And I think of that as who has the right to have the child with them and when, or you know, have the child with them and send the child off to summer camp or you know, to go visit grandma or something like that. Uh, and again, we have the statutory definition on the slide. Uh, living arrangements, residency, visitation schedule. It's where you are in space. In, in, there are 365 days in a year, in the year, um, and how that time is allocated is essentially what we mean by, by physical custody. That's sort of the writ large definition. Um, I've included this slide um, with language from a case that talks about the relationship between legal and physical custody because even if I have sole legal custody, and we'll talk about you know, what that means in a second, but if the child is with the other person, the parent or the, you know, the third party, they're gonna get to make some decisions by definition, uh, moment to moment, day to day decisions. So this is kind of a general uh, statement about how legal and physical custody inter interacts and only gets you so far. It's often not a problem the interaction doesn't pose problems, uh, sometimes it does. So that's a, 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 the biggest picture of what custody is, but we're gonna break it down even more in a moment. But I wanna uh, stop and talk about who, who has these rights going into a child's life from the, from the get-go. Uh, child is born, who has legal and physical custody? In the absence of a court order, both parents 
have legal and physical custody. They have joint legal and physical custody. That's probably true by operation of law, even in the absence of a statute or something like that, that it's probably true. The child is born, both parents have these legal and physical custody rights. There is, however, a statute that says that. It's in a kind of odd place. It's in Title 21, uh, not in Title 16, where a lot of the custody stuff is. Uh, but it does say that parents are the natural guardians of their children, uh, even though it also says the court could appoint someone else. So what the consensus view uh, of what this means is that, is that when a child is born, both parents have exactly identical rights to make decisions, to have the child be with them. And, you know, that works fine sometimes. Either the parents work it out harmoniously or it's not so harmonious, but they work it out and they never go to court. But they can go to court and the court can allocate these rights between the parents by court order. The court can also award these rights to a non-parent, a third party, under certain circumstances. And again, we're going to talk in more detail about what this means. But I'm sort of starting with the broad, broader concepts and then getting much more granular as we go through the training. So, but the court does have the authority to allocate uh, custody rights between the parents and under certain circumstances give custodial rights, legal and physical, to third parties. So what kind of custody arrangements can the court order? And this is, you'll see, going to be an entry point to talking about how we think about legal and physical custody in more detail. The statute says a custody order may include sole legal, sole physical, joint legal, joint physical, and any other custody arrangement the court determines is in the best interest of the child. Okay, that's helpful, up to a point. Still pretty general, so can we flesh that out at all? Yes, we can. So let's start with these terms joint and sole. The statute doesn't define them in any greater detail, those terms. So what I'm giving you is what I think legitimately is kind of a consensus view of how those term, what those terms mean. Joint legal means equal authority to make major decisions. And that's kind of what parents at least walked into court with. And sometimes that's what they walk out with. Sometimes they're fine with that. That may not be the, the battleground, um, but the court can certainly order joint legal. The court can also order sole legal, which I think the consensus is means that the individual, the parent or third party who has sole legal has sole authority to make those major decisions. Then we have joint physical. The statute says the court can order joint physical. I don't think anyone knows what that means. It, 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 there's, it, there's really no case law. The case law is like one case, it's incredibly cryptic and it really doesn't define joint physical. I think if you put lawyers in thumb screws, they would say maybe it me if it's not otherwise defined, it means approximately equal time with each parent. Uh, but no one, I think, really knows what it means, which I will say might caution against using that term either in an agreed, in a consent order or maybe advocating against it. I've seen it. It could work. Everything is situation specific, but you can see that vagueness might not be helpful in that area. Uh, because you'll see, that we'll talk about this more, sometimes these general terms are what you want. The lack of specificity is actually helpful, but sometimes specificity is what you, what you want. Uh, so that's joint physical. Then we have sole physical, which is also somewhat unclear. Again, I think if there were no further um, language giving it greater definition, it would probably mean that the child lives or resides with the parent or person who has sole physical custody, but the other parent has access, has visitation, has time with the child. Okay, so it's gotten a little more specific, but that's not the end of the story. And it's not the end of the story because of that provision in the statute that says that the court can order any custody arrangement that is in the best interest of the child. And what that means is the court has incredibly broad discretion to fashion custody arrangements. 
Um, and when I say the court has broad discretion, we'll talk about this later, and I think it's been talked about a little bit in a previous training session. That could mean either that the parties have ultimately reached an agreement and the court in, you know, makes that an order, or the case goes to trial and the court just orders something. So whether it's by agreement, you know, an order based on an agreement or an order after trial, the court has enormous, the court and the parties have enormous discretion. So what do I mean by that? What does that look like? What could that look like in the real world? How would the, what is the language that, that is available to you? Um, what I would say is anything that is possible in the real world is something the court can order, something the parties can agree to and or the court can order. So let's talk about sort of what that could look like or what kind of language is available to you. And I think of it as a spectrum, which is to say a language that is very general or more general and then language that is very, very specific. So I'm gonna give you some examples of general language to start with. We've talked about joint legal. You'll also see shared legal custody. We see joint legal custody with tiebreaker authority to one parent, which is really interesting because it starts out joint, but you're ultimately given decision, giving decision-making authority to, the, uh, to one parent. And in that sense, it's really like soul. But it is, uh, often you see um, settlements with that language. You also see orders after trial with that language. And I think that's for a lot of reasons that we can talk about when the time comes in a case specific setting to talk about it. It's always more helpful to talk about it in a fact specific setting. Um, I will say that I don't think that joint legal means that the parents have to consult. Reasonable minds can differ about that, but I don't think it means they have to consult. I think it just means they both have equal authority to make the decision. And sometimes you see joint legal custody, but one parent just really doesn't care and the other parent just makes all the decisions. So let's see, joint legal with tiebreaker. Then you can have joint legal or joint physical, but with additional or clarifying details. So it starts out joint legal as follows, joint physical as follows, and then you get more specific. Um, and again, you could do that with legal, you can do that with physical. You can have sole legal or sole physical. You can have primary physical. You can have, you see that language, you see primary residential. And again, you can include details or not include details. You can have a general phrase with no details, or you can have a general phrase with details. Um, and then visitation, which is a form of physical custody. There is case law that says that. Again, you can have very general language or you can have a basic schedule or you can have a somewhat more detailed schedule. Um, or you can have details that address a particular facet of either legal or physical custody. Um, so that's kind of language on the more general end of the spectrum. For language on the more specific end of the spectrum, we could um, spend a lot of time giving you examples, but it would take up a lot of examples. All I will say is you can micromanage if you want, you and the judge, uh, or the parties and the judge. Uh, you can micromanage one piece of it. You can micromanage the whole thing. So I'll just give you a very exaggerated example, uh, but it does happen. Uh, you could have a visitation arrangement where you say uh, the child is going to be picked up at five o'clock at the Benning Road Metro Station on the northeast corner with the pink backpack with four changes of clothes. I'm not saying you will have that. I'm just giving you an example. Uh, so you can get as detailed as you think will serve the best interests of the child um, about any aspect of legal or physical custody. Okay, so that's kind of what you're litigating about custody and kind of an introduction to what your options are. And again, it will make a lot more sense in a fact specific context when you're trying to figure out what's gonna work, what is, what's the best option available uh, in this situation. So I want to move um, and talk briefly about the legal standard, um, which is something at, as you at least think about the potential of having to advocate in court, you'll, you'll at least want to incorporate in your thinking. 
uh, your lodestar, your client is the best interest of the child, but like any lawyer, if you're thinking about advocacy, you're thinking about the legal standard. I will mention, and probably other, other presenters have mentioned, that in, no matter what's going on in the beginning of the case, or, not, or when you get involved in the case, which often is, is usually not the beginning, you're getting involved in the middle, um, many cases settle, probably the majority of cases settle, but cases do go to trial. Uh, or have evidentiary hearings on motions. So, you know, we'll help you kind of navigate that and predict that and think about, you know, the pros and cons of settlement versus trial. Um, and as lawyers, even if you never litigated, your, your analytical skills are gonna, gonna get you there no matter what. But let's talk for a moment about the legal standard. In parent versus parent custody cases, the legal standard is the best interest of the child. It's in the statute, it's in case law. The statute says the court shall consider all relevant factors. Um, and frankly, uh, pretty much everything is relevant to a custody determination. Occasionally there are things that are so uh, attenuated uh, in nature or in time that a judge might consider them not relevant, but you know, it's a pretty broad net, pretty all encompassing net. In addition, the statute lists 17 factors that the court must consider. They're not the only factors. Again, the court can consider anything, but the court has to consider these factors. I'm not going to go over them. They're in your materials. The reason I'm not going to go over them is most of them are kind of common sense. They're, they're ways of trying to articulate what any rational human being would consider in trying to figure out what's best for a child. Some of the factors aren't that logical, and they often are not actually germane to a particular case, in which the case the court will probably just say, and you will say, it's not that germane, I don't have to pay that much attention to it. Um, and they're not exclusive, so even though they're important, it's only one entry point to thinking about what's best for a child. You get to really dig in and think about, you know, what custody arrangement is going to be best, and then develop you're thinking about how to make that argument to the judge if it's the judge you have to make the argument to. Um, and also, you know, how to think about talking sometimes to the, to the adults about what's best for the child if you are trying to facilitate settlement. There is a statutory presumption in favor of joint custody. Um, it doesn't specify whether it's joint physical or joint legal. It's probably both, although I think judges are a little more inclined to think about the presumption in connection with legal custody, not so much with physical custody. Um, the presumption can be um, by showing that it's not in the best interest of the child for there to be joint custody. And there's a presumption against joint custody if a court has found previously, or if this judge finds that a party, a parent has committed an interfamily offense, child neglect, or parental kidnapping, and those three things are specifically defined. So you do get a little bit of certainty there. That presumption, however, is also rebuttable. So it's not, it, nobody is ruled out definitively. Every presumption is rebuttable. I will mention that how seriously the judges take these presumption is very hard to predict. Sometimes they take the presumptions very seriously. Sometimes it's as if the presumptions don't even exist. And sometimes it depends on the case, the facts, the barometric pressure, the judge. So again, we will help you figure that out and you can always sort of incorporate that in your thinking about how to approach, you know, your advocacy, whether you, you know, really um, deal with the presumption very explicitly, whether you deal with it more subtly, whether you wait and see whether the judge is like taking it seriously or not. Hope that made sense. So that's the basic substantive law of parent versus parent cases. Here's the basic substantive law in third-party custody cases. First, there is an issue in third-party custody cases that doesn't exist in parent cases, which is that ultimately, in order to be given any kind of custody or visitation rights, a third party has to have standing. And um, the bases for standing are listed here. 
uh, sometimes it's very clear that a part that a third party has standing. It is very fact based, though, so sometimes it's not clear, and sometimes the statute itself isn't that clear. But the three basic uh, standing bases are that um, a parent who is or has been the primary caregiver within the past three years consents, essentially, to standing or to the to standing. Uh, the third party has lived in the same household as the child for, for the preceding six months um, or half the child's life, the child's under age six, and primarily assumed caretaking responsibilities. In other words, the third party lived with the child um, uh, and isn't just descending from outside. Um, and then the child is living with the third party at the time of filing is how most people interpret this basis for standing and there are exceptional circumstances. Let me just say that all of these things can be alleged in the case and if they are disputed then it becomes you know a factual dispute. They often aren't disputed. Standing often isn't disputed. Once in a while it is. Uh, and then like any other you know issue in the case it becomes something for the the judge to determine based on um, evidence. So that there is another basis for standing called de facto parent. You don't see it very often. Um, it is defined. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but you'll see that it, there is a very specific uh, definition of what makes you a de facto parent. And what's interesting is that if you are a de facto parent, the legal standard and anything else related to substantive law is actually the law of parent versus parent cases. You get to be treated like a parent, not like a third party for purposes of the legal standard. Um, de facto parent was the main purpose of having it in the statute was um, uh, the goal of letting um, uh, same sex uh, partners, uh, partners in same sex relationships uh, where one of the uh, partners was not um, uh, the biological parent to allow that person to be treated as a parent, although you could have a de facto parent even in heterosexual um, relationships, but you'll, you'll, you would see by the definition that there are a lot of things you have to do to be a de facto parent or that have to have happened. Um, and uh, uh, it could be either a same sex relationship or an, or a, 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 an opposite sex relationship, but you don't see de facto parent coming into play much. Um, uh, anymore these days um, for a lot of reasons which tend to be changes in the law that 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 make it easier for same-sex couples to to parent children together um, okay so let's talk about the legal standard um, it's a two-part two-prong standard the court must find that the what is known as the parental presumption has been rebutted and also must find that custody with the third party or visitation is in the best interest of the child. So let's talk about rebutting the parental presumption. The parental presumption is a phrase that is used to um, uh, embody the legal principle that there is a presumption that it is in the child's best interest to be in the custody of a fit parent. That presumption is grounded in constitutional law and has been essentially uh, adopted by, by the law of the District of Columbia. The statute does give several bases for rebutting the presumption. They're fairly general. Again, you'll see them. I'm not going to go into them right now. Um, there's not really any case law on this yet. And so, again, you need to be aware of the law, but I think in terms of your role as a GAL, you're trying to figure out what's best, and then if you've got to advocate with the judge, you try to make it fit. Um, that's my little practice pointer. Um, and you'll see that the statutory bases are so general that they only, they give you very, they give you pretty, the guidance they give you is pretty limited. So I think you just, you typically want to tell a compelling factual story and, but you do need, obviously, to be, be aware if it's a third party custody case um, that the judge does have to reference the law at some point. The best interest prong, there are four non-exclusive factors. Again, the court can consider anything that's relevant, but there are four mandatory factors that must be considered. Um, 
The parent versus parent 17 factors in 16-914 do not specifically apply, but they may be instructive in terms of thinking about best interests and ultimately how to advocate about best interests. And there is a rebuttable presumption related to um, the commission of an intrafamily offense. All right, so that's the legal standard. A couple of other things about the law that I think it's helpful to throw in. They, it may never be something you have to think about, but you never know. So we like to give you the broad brush, you know, uh, as much information as we can. Custody orders last indefinitely unless and until modified. They end by operation of law at age 18, which is the age of majority in DC. Family court cannot award custody of an adult human being to anyone. Uh, they just can't. Um, so by operation of law, child turns 18, it's over. Modification. Uh, custody is always modifiable. Um, people use the phrase permanent custody. They use it all the time. You see it. You see it in court orders. But just be aware, it's not actually permanent. Uh, the court can modify. Um, and I will just another little personal practice pointer. I tend to stay away from the phrase permanent. I think it misleads people in a way that often isn't helpful to you in getting people, often in terms of settlement, you know, if you're trying to facilitate settlement. Um, sometimes it's helpful, but often it's, it's not uh, to use that phrase permanent. Um, so what's the legal standard for modification? Um, in parent, it, generally speaking, it's uh, that there has been a substantial and material change in circumstances and that the modification is in the best interest of the child. Uh, there is an exception to that, which I'll get to in a moment, but basically you've got to show the judge, yeah, there's been a change that justifies modification. You'll see why I'm talking about modification in a moment. Um, it, not only do I want to give you the big picture because you, you kind of also sometimes want to think ahead beyond why you're there, but there are other reasons to be talking about modification, uh, even if you're not in the middle of a modification proceeding. Um, how are custody orders enforced? Well, um, the, the main enforcement mechanism is a motion for civil contempt. Sometimes you see a motion to enforce the order. I'm not going to dwell on the legal issues about what contempt looks like or what a motion to enforce the order looks like. Should you find yourself in that setting, we can talk about it. Uh, the technical issues don't actually really come into play that much. Basically, everyone's getting back in front of the judge to figure out what in heaven's name to do. Um, I want to mention a statute because I feel, again, it's there, you need to know it exists, but you're probably not gonna have to deal with it. But I, so I'm gonna kind of whiz through these slides, but I just want you to know about it. Um, Cause once in a while it comes up. So I'll just give you a taste of it. There is a statute that governs what court has jurisdiction to hear, to make a custody determination. And it's called the UCCJEA. Um, and the basic principle behind the UCCJEA is that only one state has, at a time has jurisdiction to make a custody determination. The analysis is different depending on whether this is the first time the court has ever made a custody determination or whether there's been a previous custody determination. Um, and there's a different analytical framework. Um, in, a, court, a custody order can be enforced anywhere, but if the court is being asked to make a determination or a change in a previous determination, then you've got to figure out, is it initial, is it modification, and do the math. Um, there's kind of a narrow exception to the one state at a time um, uh, principle, but we're not going to go into it because you don't need to hear about it because it doesn't come up very often, or it won't come up for you very often. And we do try to screen cases um, for uh, jurisdiction. And again, you are going to be getting involved after a case has already been filed and usually after there's already been at least one hearing and probably more. So typically jurisdiction has our, is, is, you know, there is jurisdiction in DC, but every once in a while 
a jurisdictional issue pops up later. Uh, and we'll help you if it does. So these are what I call UCCJA red flags, which is, oh, if you notice one of these things, you might take a look at whether DC has jurisdiction or not. Um, it may still be the right place, but these are sometimes things that, that if, if you were starting from scratch, you would say, oh, let's make sure DC has jurisdiction. But again, don't spend a lot of time worrying about this at this stage of the game. All right, so that's my overview of the substantive law of custody. So I'm gonna whiz you through procedure, but again, I think it's important context to know what came before, what might've gone before you got involved, the points at which you might get involved and how things are gonna look after you get involved. And you may have gotten a taste of this already, uh, but I'm gonna give you kind of the overview. So we've talked about how divorce and custody cases are um, heard in the domestic relations branch of family court of DC Superior Court. That's, you know, you'll be dealing with the family court clerk's office. Uh, you'll be on uh, uh, assigned to a judge's calendar in the domestic relations branch, which we abbreviate as DRB. It's a DRB case in the DRB branch. Uh, the clerk's office you'll be dealing with is the family court clerk's office. Right now it's operating remote, remotely online on the phone. It's physically located in room JM 300. I won't tell you what I usually tell you about the physical setup because you won't be going there anytime soon. Uh, and if they do reopen, we can talk about it. Um, divorce and custody court files, case files are open to the public. They are not confidential files, um, but they're not available online. So you can't go on the court website and pull up a case file. We can help you get pleadings though and orders. We can help you get that paper. Normally you'd go down to court and ask the clerk's office to print it out or copy it for you. Can't do that, we will help you get the paper. Um, and one of the reasons we can help you get the paper, I mean, we could have done it anyway, is our court, Superior Court, ha has pretty much gone paperless. Family Court was one of the last divisions to go paperless, but they pretty much have. So everything gets scanned into an electronic database called CourtView. Um, so even though this stuff is not available online to you, know, you or us, it is in, ele in an electronic uh, database uh, at court. Hope that made sense. Um, part of the clerk's office, a discrete part, is called the Family Court Central Intake Center. And they handle essentially, their biggest uh, mission is that's the part of the clerk's office that you file pleadings through. Uh, so in the pre-electronic days, you'd walk down and go to CIC uh, at JM 520. Uh, JM is a level of the court. Um, it's the level below the first floor. Um, so it's room JM 520 and you'd file a pleading. Even before the pandemic, lawyers have to e-file. And so you, you would have been e-filing anyway and now you are gonna e you're, gonna, you're definitely gonna be e-filing. And we've given you lots of uh, explanations of the e-filing system. It's called Case File Express. It's very easy to register. It's pretty, it's actually easy to file through Case File Express. I figured it out. They screw up once in a while and you have to call them and say, really, you have to accept this pleading, but it, it's, it works pretty smoothly. Uh, works pretty smoothly. So we have a lot of materials and we can walk you through e-filing, you know, when the time comes for you to e-file something. So the basic life cycle of a, of a DRB case is the plaintiff files a complaint. Um, in the old days, uh, pre-pandemic, an initial court hearing was scheduled by the clerk at the time of filing. So the plaintiff walked away knowing uh, when the initial hearing was gonna be and one, this, it, there was a notice to the defendant that would be served with, that the plaintiff would have to serve with the complaint. They're not setting initial court hearings these days, but again, you're not getting involved at this stage of the game. There's already been something going on in your case, but I do want to give you a sense of, of how things work. And again, a case is assigned to a specific judge, a specific calendar at the time of filing. So, you know, you know when, when people file, they walk, they walk out knowing who the judge is and when the initial hearing is. And the initial hearing is, is a status hearing. 
the plaintiff is responsible for service uh, and the defendant is supposed to file an answer like what we learned in civil procedure, but a lot of pro se litigants never file answers and the judges frankly have often given up on making them file answers. Uh, I will just be honest, you may, there may be no answer in the case you're appointed in. Um, and I will also mention um, that, you know, in some cases, the pleadings are minimal. The litigants are pro se, they are using forms that have been designed for pro se litigants. So you're gonna wanna see the pleadings, but there's often not that much to see. But in some cases, there is more to see. Uh, it's just gonna depend. Um, this is information about how to file a complaint, which again, you're not gonna have to worry about, so I'm not gonna spend any time on this slide. Um, at the initial hearing, it's a status hearing. Uh, again, right now, everything is being done remotely, and that is, uh, hearings are being done remotely, and you're, you know, we're giving you information about that. The judge will give you information about that. Um, uh, and uh, um, I don't see that changing anytime soon, the remoteness of it. Um, and it's a status hearing, and every case is in a different posture at the time of the initial status hearing. Sometimes the, power, the defendant hasn't even been served, but sometimes things start to happen. And I think you've already heard about some of the things that can happen at initial hearings. Um, and these are some of the things that may have already happened. And we talk about we we talk about them more in the materials. I think you've gotten more information about these things in other parts of the training. Um, I like to mention them again because those things can happen at any status hearing, and often there are multiple status hearings in a case. The judge wants to status it, or you want to status it. In other words, you're an advocate. You know the judge makes the decisions, but you're going to get input in any decision that's made, including. What is the next hearing? Is it a status hearing? Is it trial? Is it, you know, how far away is it? Uh, is there going to be a motions hearing of some sort? Uh, so you will have input in all of those decisions and you can advocate for whatever game plan you think is, is best. Um, if a case, if, if ultimately the, 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 the decision is, we're, we're, it looks like we're going to trial, so let's start moving towards trial. Um, judges will often set pretrial hearings. They are usually not elaborate pretrial hearings the way you might get in, an, in a Microsoft antitrust case, but it's a status more designed to um, tee the case up for trial. It could be a five minute status hearing or it could be a, something that does involve more discussion. You might be asked to do a, pre, a basic pretrial statement. Uh, what is often more common is that the judge directs people to exchange witness and exhibits lists. So, you know, again, you'll play it by ear. We'll help you think about what would work best in your case, what is most likely that the judge is gonna be thinking in terms of and help you kind of figure out how to shape this the way you wanna shape it. Uh, but again, it, it's usually not super elaborate. And I think this has been mentioned before, but now might be a time to say that in many of these cases, both parties are pro se. And in many other cases, only one party has counsel. And that's why some elaborateness that you might see if both parties had counsel is just not realistic in these cases and people just capitulate to what's realistic you don't have to though but you can see why you know litigating with pro se litigants might not lend itself to elaborate pretrial statements um, uh, i think settlement has been discussed in other other um contexts but um settlement in a custody case um almost always means a consent order rather than the parties reach an agreement and drop the litigation. It's probably what they're gonna want and it's probably what you're gonna want as the GAL, an order read and then, oh, we're all just gonna go home now. But you know, you'll see. Um, the statutes provide that the court must accept the agreement of the parties unless by clear and convincing evidence it's not in the best interest of the child. It is rare for a court to even think about rejecting a settlement um, and Frankly, as the GAL, you will have probably, if there is a settlement, it'll be what you want as well. But it's not impossible that you could challenge uh, 
the acceptance of a settlement and if that were to happen, we could help walk you through that. I, I've only, in, in 40 years, I've only wanted to do that once and then didn't even have to after discussion with the parties because um, it was an insane settlement. And, um, but once there was some discussion, the, it broke down, in a, it, which was a good thing. Um, sorry. Okay. Just a quick overview of settlements in third-party custody cases, because um, we're, we're almost done with the training, but I don't want to spend too much time on this because it makes much more sense to talk about it if you have a third-party custody case in which settlement is, is, you know, coming up on the horizon and you're happy about it. Um, third party, the third-party custody statute provides for something called revocable consent. And it says that upon revocation of consent, the order shall be immediately vacated and have no further force, force and effect. And what that means as a practical matter is that if you are in a, uh, you might find yourself in a, a, situ a modification proceeding where there was a custody order entered, you know, five years ago, a year ago, six months ago, but somebody's filed to modify. And if consent is, and a, let's say a parent filed to modify, if it's revocable consent, that rolls back the videotape so that you're not in really in modification. It's not a modification standard anymore. It's the legal standard that would apply as if custody were being determined for the very first time. So the, the whether consent is revocable or not has an impact on what the legal standard is going forward. I hope that made sense. Um, so in other words, if consent, if consent is revocable and it's revoked, the complaint would still be pending. That's the consensus view, is that the complaint hasn't gone away. The case would resume, but the legal standard would be the standard for third-party custody, not the legal standard for modification. Um, consent can be made, quote, non-revocable, though, which doesn't mean, again, you, can, you can, can't modify. It just means that you're in modification territory. No one really knows what makes a consent um, uh, uh, um, non-revocable, uh, but there are slides about it, there are materials about it, and if you are faced with that situation, we can really walk you through thinking about how much you care about whether it's revocable or not. And fundamentally, you may not care. Uh, I'll just dangle that prospect in front of you that um, it might be better to get a settlement and not raise the issue of revocability and deal with the future when it happens, or have the parties deal with the future when it happens. But sometimes it does matter, so we'll help you think that through. Uh, and I've got some slides about the procedure that is currently followed if, if for revocation. And again, you'll probably be in the middle of that, so you won't really have to, to think about the procedure. Uh, it will have already happened, and you'll be appointed um, to help the judge decide what's in the best interest of the child. Trial, I think, has been discussed. It really is an evidentiary hearing. Uh, it looks more like a conventional trial um, than, than status hearings uh, sometimes do. Um, so, um, again, what might happen after a final order? Motion to modify, motion for contempt or enforce the order. Um, and so that's kind of the life cycle of a case. And I know I've kind of whizzed you through it, but right now I think that really is all you need to know. And I want to just situate you in that in a very general way. When in this life cycle are you going to be appointed? Uh, typically there will have been at really always at least one hearing, an initial status hearing or another status hearing. The judges don't look at cases and decide on the papers, oh, I want a GAL. I've never seen that happen. Uh, so you'll get appointed in medias race, like somewhere in the middle of things. Occasionally, GALs are appointed after trial and before a decision. That's incredibly rare. Once in a while, you're appointed when the, the, defendant, parent, the defendant defaults, and the judge is like, wait a minute, I, I need somebody to kind of make sure I just don't want to proceed in default. I need somebody to see what the heck's going on here. 
Um, GALs are also appointed in connection with motions to modify and motions for contempt. That's why I, I spent so much time on them, that, that that may be the kind of custody proceeding you are appointed in. So my last slide, my last thing that I want to say to you um, is a, a practice pointer. Formality versus informality. Um, family court can be more informal. What do I mean by that? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. Rules of evidence, what, really? Um, who cares? Uh, oh, I have to decide, the judge has to decide temporary custody? Well, shouldn't that be done based on an evidentiary hearing? Yeah, I think so, but a lot of, but it is an incredibly common practice for judges to make temporary custody and vis visitation decisions and to tweak those decisions without having evidentiary hearings. Just everybody standing at council table, going back and forth, and the judge makes a decision. Sometimes it's difficult to predict with certainty when the proceedings will or won't be more informal. Sometimes you can predict. I don't mean to make this sound like, like utter mystery reading the tea leaves, but you know sometimes it is difficult to predict. So what I, we will help you make those predictions. And what I like to say to advocates is, if it's more informal and it's working for you, go with it. If you want greater formality, if, that, if you think that's the better way to proceed, you invoke it. And often the judge will go, oh yeah, you're right. We have to do this more formally. We have to follow the rules. Um, and so again, we will help you navigate that. And it is really easier to navigate than I'm making it sound. I just wanted to, to, to mention that. I felt, I, I, I always feel I need to mention that. So that's the end of my presentation. You will see that there are other slides and other materials about child support. Child support is not part of your mandate, but sometimes when it's a part of the case, it's helpful to understand it. Uh, sometimes you just watch it happen, but sometimes the parties don't understand it. And if you understand it, you can see that how it is sometimes a barrier to, to settlement. And again, settlement is not the goal of the case. The best interest of the child is the goal, but often cases do settle in a way that you feel is in the best interest of the child and getting rid of barriers can be helpful. So again, if child support an issue is an issue, it's very easy to understand how it works and what the barriers could be and we can help you do that. Um, but again, it's, it's not typical for you to have to think about it. And again, we have slides about civil protection orders. It's not likely that you will be appointed uh, but sometimes there have been CPOs uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the lives of the parties and it can just be helpful to understand what they're about. So again, we can always walk you through that. So I think I have more or less ended on time. So I will be quiet now. I will try to stop sharing the screen. And um, I will end, I guess, by saying thank you again and let you know that I'm, I can hang out and see if anybody has any questions. Thank you so much, Diane. I uh, just want to say thanks again for everyone joining. If you have to help us, we understand. If you're watching this on demand, we're at the end of the material for today. Uh, we do have in the chat function, if you're with us live, um, a link to the training survey. So we would love to hear uh, any of your feedback today. I will go ahead and uh, end our recording here. Thanks again for those watching on demand. Please reach out if you have questions.